good afternoon, everyone. Um, it falls on. It's a privilege for me to welcome you all to this afternoon's roundtable. As you know, we uh, organize a roundtable with Dhaka Tribune every month, and as part of the series, we are today looking at the Rohingya crisis. I um, bring greetings and apologies from General Munir Zaman and Mr. Zafar Soban, both of whom are actually away from the country. So for this afternoon, for better or for worse, you are with me. So hopefully I can uh, keep, uh, keep you all inf informed and amused at the same time. So we have a very uh, important panel with us this afternoon to talk about this issue. We have on my uh, left Air Vice Marshal Mahmoud Hussain, a strategic commentator, former uh, ambassador of Bangladesh, and also an instructor at the National Defense College. And uh, we also have Mr. Asif Munir, who on the Rohingya issue uh, has been a very known face, uh, both in Bangladesh and abroad, a migration expert, and someone who's done tremendous work in informing us about the various facets of the crisis. I still remember when the Rohingya refugee influx happened in 2017. I was actually in uh, Germany at that point of time, and the kind of international interest it generated. It's been almost five years, and the crisis uh, still continues. Uh, the numbers are quite high. And just today, if you look at today's Daily Star uh, newspaper, and several other papers have also carried it over time, there is now, now talk about Indian uh, Rohingyas from India coming into Bangladesh. So it just goes to show the level of complexity of this crisis and the way it is evolving and increasing over time. The government of Bangladesh and Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina herself have time and again said that it is absolutely incumbent upon the international community to help Bangladesh resolve this crisis. And when we say resolution, we mean a voluntary repatriation, a peaceful and voluntary repatriation of all the refugees back to the country where they came from, which is Myanmar. We are quite grateful to the international community for the humanitarian support that has been rendered to Bangladesh, but unfortunately, uh, there is no immediate solution in sight. And what we intend to do this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, is to brainstorm and try to find out how we can get out of this problem and how we can resolve it peacefully. Since February last year, as you're aware, there have been some major changes in Myanmar as well with the military takeover. And that presents to us yet another challenge on how we work with the new administration in Napido to resolve this crisis. So to deliberate on those and other issues, uh, we are, as I said, I'm very happy that we have a, an excellent panel with us. And so, can I just put the board on? We will just uh, go, go to the main uh, contents of the round table now. And uh, I would uh, kindly request Mr. Asif Munir to sp uh, speak first, and then we'll go to Air Vice Marshal Mahmoud Hussain. Uh, Asif Bhai, you have the floor. Thank you very much. First of all, uh, uh, thanks to the organizers, both uh, BIPSS and Dhaka Tribune for inviting me and uh, considering that uh, I'm an expert to talk about this. I can see around the room there are people that I know who work on this issue or talk about it. So I feel humbled to be here speaking, but I'm sure, as you mentioned, this is a brainstorming. What I would talk about is more maybe teasers for the brainstorming. I'm sure you already, some of you have been working on this issue or um, have years of experience on uh, various aspects of, of the challenge. And uh, as far as our time is, we would uh, hear from you and I would also like to hear from you. And also, I'm keen to interest from you, uh, hear from you sir, as well, uh, on your perspective. Um, so what uh, I discussed a little bit with General Munizaman before he left, I would cover that. And I would not go into the background because I feel that you more or less know about the background or some of the current status. So as I discussed with Junan Muzuman, it's looking at, you know, looking at the uh, title of the program, Revisiting the Rohingya Crisis, What Lies Ahead? So ahead is what I was looking at when I was thinking what I'm going to talk about. So I just have a few points on what's ahead. So straight away, uh, and you know, I'm an independent um, uh, sort of uh, analyst, so I speak from my own perspective. I think that uh, when we're talking about ahead, we are talking no less than 10 years, at least, uh, next 10 years or so, and we can't be naive about it. Of course, the government would have logically their own position, uh, looking at a shorter term. 
if we're talking about from 2017, already several years have gone and there hasn't been much progress, but at least some, and you're aware of it, those who are following the issue. So in terms of a 10-year perspective, say from now and then after 10 years, or within 10 years, what are the aspects um, that might change or we might be looking at? And again, looking at the glass half full in terms of solutions uh, and positive impact or positive outcome for the Rohingyas themselves. So one aspect is um, humanitarian plus plus. So going beyond the humanitarian support and looking at the nexus between development and humanitarian work. Um, even if we look at from 2017, where when we had the largest influx so far, although we are aware that from the 70s, from 78 onwards, there has been different phases when there was this influx, um, and more recent, so in 2012 and 2016, before 2017. Although we do talk about the uh, major influx in 2017, but bear in mind that the Rohingyas uh, many of them actually even uh, before 1971, before the Liberation War. And that's the part of the history as well. Uh, who have, maybe in smaller numbers, have come in since the Second World War. From the 50s, 60s and so on. Maybe smaller numbers. And some of whom have already integrated into Bangladesh. Maybe very small numbers, but I'm, I'm, I'm speaking from what I know from government records uh, or initiatives. Uh, for instance, from the Bangladesh Bureau of Statistics, who actually were conducting a census of the Rohingya population before the crisis, before the 2017 crisis, uh, around 2016. And they went uh, beyond Coxal Bazar to Chittagong, Borisal, Potwakhali, and they found, uh, you know, very few numbers, but Rohingyas who have settled there or several generations. But yes, we're talking about more of the uh, challenges that we have seen since uh, 2017. So when we're talking about humanitarian plus plus, one of the aspects that uh, in recent times, and some of you are probably aware of it, that especially from the uh, UN system, the UN agencies who are working with the Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh, uh, they have come up and negotiate with the, with the government about uh, looking at livelihood opportunities, whether it's possible or not. And there have been very smaller level pilots with UNHCR and IOM looking at perhaps producing some of the things that uh, can be used within the camps. For instance, uh, women's clothing or uh, chappals, sandals, uh, but in a smaller scale. Looking at if these are not commercially, but used actually within the camps but produced within the camps by the uh, camp inhabitants. But that's just one example of a livelihood opportunity. And this again, um, I'm specifically talking about within the camps, because we've seen in recent years, because of the securitization of the issue, and maybe I'll touch upon briefly upon that, and um, I, would hear, I would like to hear more from, uh, uh, sir, from you about your point of view a little bit on the issue of security uh, and the Rohingya issue. Uh, but I'll have a very small perspective on that as well. But that's why I'm talking about the UN agencies have negotiated with the government, with the office of the RRC, and also with uh, the different ministries, whether there could be live uh, activities within the camps, apart from the work that they're involved in, repair work, road, and other construction work, so beyond that. The other aspect, uh, very important, is education. Uh, and very recently, this has come up in the media as well, that um, government uh, is looking at, uh, with uh, UNICEF and others, um, education within uh, what is called a Myanmar curriculum. But I know that for many of us, uh, there are question marks whether that's the way forward or not. But that's the government position. Government would like to have, uh, if there is an education, it's within a Myanmar curriculum. And NGOs and activists have talked about that whether that makes uh, so much sense for the Rohingyas because uh, they have their own identity, they have their own or should have their own identity and their own uh, aspects of their language and education system, which is not necessarily um, uh, at par always with the uh, Myanmar education system, uh, being an ethnic population. But 
that's a question of debate. But the other aspect is not just the children themselves, or for young people and even for adults. Because when you're talking about moving beyond humanitarian, you think about people who have come in 2017, the same kind of crisis that they had when they arrived of uh, you know, malnutrition, fear, a lot of the other challenges that, and the trauma, the issues of PTSD, all of that in 2017, a lot of the organizations and including the government uh, authorities have worked on that with them and to some extent there's some kind of human resilience that has worked there as well. So um, to keep people occupied you need something beyond just a relief oriented support where you just provide the bare essentials, um, the food, shelter and other basic essentials. What beyond that? And that is why also the issue of livelihood comes in as well. And a lot of organizations who are working there, and again, many of you probably work with them as well, you're aware of it, you've had your own visits, do talk about the um, fear that a lot of young people, and probably mostly men, young men maybe in their teens or in their 20s, um, are vulnerable to access to maybe extremist groups or criminal activities, not by themselves, they might be used or taken uh, for that. And even by the uh, recent development, especially during last year, the armed groups that have come up. I know for a fact from uh, young Rohingya friends or acquaintances that some sometimes fear staying in their sheds at night, just with, for the fear that they might be picked up by uh, one of the uh, armed groups uh, to join them. So. Uh, there is either the fear factor or some kind of pressure to get involved in different kinds of activities. So uh, engaging them into some kind of activity within the camps would be important. Just not providing them with food and shelter, food and shelter, or maybe healthcare, or uh, you know, what's and water and sanitation support. Going beyond that. So that's just one point. The other issue of the uh, about social cohesion, and I'm sure many of you have been using this term a lot, in especially since 2017. But what we've seen in 2017 or 18, either a fear or in some cases a reality, the tension between the local community, where, which is termed as host community, but I would just say local community in Coxie Bazaar, the Bangladeshis, and, and the Rohingyas who came. And there was a lot of fear, and in some cases there were uh, legitimate fears of tensions between the two communities. Whether it's a livelihood outside the camps, whether it's about human relationships, uh, access to the market, and so on. So there was that. But uh, more recent, so, and especially again in the last year, the tensions, the issue of peace building is more of an issue within the camps. And especially since 2017, there are three categories of Rohingyas. So one, yes, of course, they were from the 70s, but if we say more recently, those who came in the 90s, so from 92, 93 onwards, or after the repatriation in the early 90s, those who came uh, in the later half of 90s, then those who came um, slightly after that, uh, but then the division between them, uh, those who came around in the 90s, they're more in the registered camps, or they're called the registered refugees. Then in 2013, according to the government policy, those who were called UMNs, uh, 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 unregistered uh, Myanmar nationals and then since 2017 which the government calls officially FDMNs forcibly displaced Myanmar nationals. So there are these three categories of Rohingyas and they have their internal tensions within them and we've seen situations where there have been protests of whether one group is getting more services or access to services or not or a fear of that so that is there but also the rise of these different armed groups who are alleged to be involved in more criminal activities maybe not a large number of people but some who actually have uh, automatic weapons uh, within the camps how they operate within uh, the camps uh, um, where are uh, Law enforcing agencies are also present, that's a question, but I know for sure that things have improved, say, in the last few months, with the um, presence of a uh, police force called APBN, 
So uh, the issue of social cohesion and peace building will be more and more an issue within the camps in the coming years or so. Um, the issue of over-secularization that I want to mention from my point of view that that uh, fear should actually come down in the coming years if we don't have very clear evidence. Especially after the 2018 uh, August, there was a fear that uh, there might be uh, violence or you know, escalation of violence uh, outside the camps between Bangladeshis and the Rohingyas, but uh, since then we haven't seen that. So uh, it remains a speculation uh, from my point of view. Uh, but in terms of law and order situation, uh, especially within the camps, and we see that from the government side, there is a trend towards moving towards uh, in terms of securing law and order, looking at it from a security point of view. We know that uh, since 2013, the Minister of Foreign Affairs had a, a more leading role, but more in the recent years we've seen Minister of Home Affairs having a leading role on deciding on the law and order situation. And uh, the result has been the fencing, the uh, APBN, being placed there, and so on and so forth. Um, so that issue will uh, come up and down. As I said, the uh, armed agencies, armed groups have, um, to some extent, been controlled. Uh, How many minutes do I have? Uh, take maybe another five minutes. Sure. Okay. Uh, then the issue which we have seen very recently with some of the NGOs who are working there, uh, and uh, very few on the legal aid aspect. Uh, this may require more uh, enforcement in the coming days, either as legal aid or legal awareness, because if you want to ensure law and order, uh, it's not just the enforcement of uh, uh, you know, force. You can also have uh, people's voluntary uh, you know, recognition of the laws in Bangladesh and how to abide by that, and also seek recourse if there is any kind of uh, issues where there's injustice against them. Uh, the other aspect which is very important, especially after the demise of Mr. Mahabullah, is the leadership issue of representation of Rohingya themselves. We talk around the table, we go on visits, but very seldom we get to have a representative talking to us or directly talking to us, a legitimate representative. And I'm talking about within Bangladesh, of course. Uh, among the Rohingyas and uh, government is wary of organizations who want to uh, sort of encourage leadership or provide leadership training but I think there's room for advocacy and uh, should not be a fair factor in terms of the representation and they should be able to sit across the table uh, to discuss about some of the issues that we're talking about. Um, just going beyond uh, the borders, few issues and I'm sure there are a lot of people here again who have a more international perspective, but I'll just touch upon the issues briefly. One is the issue of the accountability, so we talk about nothing much has happened, but still at least there's an effort both by the ICC and the ICJ, and also uh, within the UN, at least we have seen the UN Third Committee meetings where there has been more and more support towards Rohingyas, or re even by the US recently uh, in, in the last few months, a recognition that there has been, uh, you know, atrocities uh, against uh, the Rohingyas. Um, democratic uh, process within Myanmar, whether that's a reality or not, but at least after the military takeover, one of the um, groups, uh, the oppo opposition groups, uh, where the internet had circulated something where they said that if they come to power in future in Myanmar, they would. Uh, ensure recognize all the rights of the Rohingyas. Uh, yes. Um, so that's something that uh, at that time we said we have to, uh, you know, evaluate that whether it's just kind of trying to win support for the opposition movement or whether they really, uh, you know, mean what they uh, have said. But that remains to be seen. But that can be an exploratory uh, phase in the next few years to look into that. Um, but also, if there is a process within Myanmar. That's probably something that needs to be looked into, not kind of by force, because uh, putting some kind of embargo or you know different kinds of pressure on Myanmar may not work. So if there is some kind of a, uh, acceptance of the Rohingya narrative within Myanmar, 
And that has happened to some extent among civil society groups founded in Myanmar or even uh, among young people and through innovative uh, approaches uh, using chats and apps by young people who have communicated, you know, young people from uh, the camps here with young people in Myanmar. Uh, and there is to some extent some recognition of the uh, challenges that they have faced in Myanmar. So that's one thing to explore. Um, and then I would come to the kind of like the last point about the uh, third country resettlement. Very recently, uh, the media have been approaching some of us of asking about the US position or intention about third country relocation. But at least for myself, I've been talking about this for the last two years, that not just looking at the usual pattern of third country resettlement, because this has happened in 2010 um, with the involvement of the US State Department and um, UNHCR and IOM. And it was stopped by the Minister of Foreign Affairs after a while because it was felt that it might create a pull factor from uh, Myanmar. Um, but that wasn't really the case at that time. But the issue of resettlement within the region, mm. within the region meaning, for instance, countries where even Rohingyas might feel comfortable to move to, even if it's a temporary resettlement. Um, for instance, Indonesia or Malaysia, uh, or con other countries within the region, close proximity to, uh, or at least within the Southeast Asia region. And there hasn't been, a, at, until now, no official discussion with these countries. And the government, I've seen the different times have had different positions on this. Um, and some of you have seen that in the media. And last but not least, the issue of Bhashanchar. Looking at Bhashanchar, um, I would say we can look at it more positively now, uh, the experience of Bhashanchar. Uh, and again, I link it with the th third country resettlement. So if there can be a scenario in the next 10 years, uh, if there's no solution at site of the repatriation, if there's a possibility of third country resettlement or even temporary resettlement to um, islands within Southeast East Asia, where the Bhashanchar experience can be replicated or promoted, if there are good practices within uh, Bhashanchar. Of course, there are some challenges, teething problems in the first year or so. We have seen people who have come in, who have tried to flee from Bhashanchar, they have brought back to Cox's Bazar, or those who have been intercepted while they were trying to uh, go to Malaysia. Uh, by boat, they have been taken or be, being uh, supposedly taken to Bhashanchar. But these are initial challenges. Hopefully, if things settle down and if there is a more community, Bhashanchar and along with the uh, mainland, uh, Noakhali and Shandip, if there is more, uh, more like a Cox Bajar environment, maybe things would improve there. Uh, and that can be an issue that can be taken up as an advocacy. So these are kind of broad areas, so, you know, and Perhaps when we go into discussions, we can elaborate on some of them. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it was a very important set of points that you've put forward before us. I mean, I've taken a lot of important phrases that have come. For example, that uh, we have three categories of uh, Rohingya displaced people in Bangladesh, which I think we quite often we are not aware of that reality because there, were, there was an influx long before 2017, and there have been a series of influxes into Bangladesh, which is a fact that is sometimes ignored. Also, the whole issue about who do we talk to in terms of representation after the death of Mr. Muibullah and the changes that have taken place in Myanmar and how that has a bearing on the situation here. So without further ado, I think I will go to uh, Air Vice Marshal Mahmoud Hussain for another perspective on the issue, and then we will come back to uh, the discussion later. Thank you, sir. The floor thank, is yours. thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Shafkat Munir, and thank you very much, uh, Mr. Asif Munir. Uh, Mr. Shafkat Munir, uh, the moderator, Mr. Asif Munir, national expert on migration and displacement, and dear audience, Assalamu alaikum and a good afternoon. Now, revisiting Rohingya crisis, what lies ahead is an intellectual exercise in probability but it falls in the domain of social science. What is the disturbing point here is that the social science is not exact in predicting phenomenon and as such conditions necessary for solving a problem may not be sufficient as in the case of physical science. So any discussion about the Rohingyas and their future will be at the level of hypothesis in the sense of epistemology. 
We can only make conjectures in the proper sense after the great philosopher of science Karl Popper and leave the future either to refute or validate our conjectures. Given the focus, I'll be dealing with the crisis from a strategic point of view, primarily centered upon the question of security dilemma, both for Rohingyas and state actors directly involved with the crisis. Now, in the study of international relations, the players who define the outcome of a crisis are called the actors. In case of Rohingya crisis, there are principally three actors operating at local, regional, and global levels. So that makes Rohingyas the pawn on the grand geopolitical chessboard. At the global level, it should be examined in the context of the rivalry between the United States and China. As recently as 21st March 2022, the U.S. Secretary of State Anthony J. Blinken has condemned the atrocities on Rohingyas by the military junta of Myanmar as genocide and crimes against humanity. This time, the U.S. condemnation has come with stronger words with its recognition of the exceptional generosity of Bangladesh in hosting over 1 million Rohingya refugees, including Bangladesh's efforts to vaccinate thousands of Rohingyas as part of its national COVID-19 vaccination campaign. The U.S. government has also come up with stronger measures by slapping sanctions on five military leaders, including Myanmar's military dictator, Min Aung Hlien, military-affiliated cronies and businesses and a military unit for committing genocide, crimes, and ethnic cleansing against Rohingyas. The U.S. ally, Europe has followed somewhat ambivalent approach in dealing with Myanmar. While it condemns the Burmese military's atrocities against the Rohingyas, its trade relations with Myanmar remains good after China and Thailand. You EU's contention is that any economic sanctions imposed on Myanmar do not affect its military to change policy for the political settlement of the Rohingyas. Yet Europe's support in terms of humanitarian assistance in Rohingya crisis is reckonable. However, when crimes against humanity become an international issue and its bills are rung at the eardrums of global conscience, norms and institutions need to play aggressively to make justice a tool for change in behavior of the social system. In November 2019, Gambia filed a case before the International Court of Justice on behalf of the 57 Organization of Islamic Cooperation Countries, underlining the critical importance of bringing justice for Myanmar. It is predicted that the ICJ hearings are the next step in the landmark case to break the cycle of violence and impunity in Myanmar. If it is so, the Human Rights Watch believes that the case could build a pathway to justice not only for the Rohingya but everyone in the country. However, the challenge to Rohingya crisis at the international level comes from another great power, China. China-Myanmar bilateral relations have been strong. Burma was the first non-communist country. We have to remember to recognize the communist-led People's Republic of China after its foundation in 1949. Facing growing international condemnation and pressure, Myanmar has cultivated a strong relationship with China to bolster itself. In turn, China's influence has grown rapidly. China has made a conciliated move through a three-stage plan between Bangladesh and Myanmar to resolve the protracted Rohingya crisis. Though the United Nations was not a party to this Chinese-sponsored bilateral agreement for repatriation, it has accepted it. But the question remains, without international intervention, there remains very little possibility of the Rohingyas being taken back. At the regional level, Rohingya issue has raised strong security tensions along religious lines in South Asia. This fits neatly into the strategy of India. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi's visit in September 2017 to defend Myanmar's military crackdown against the Rohingyas in its alleged fight against terrorism is evidence of the level of alignment of India's foreign policy with Myanmar in the issue. The atrocities against the Rohingya forced nearly a million people to flee Myanmar and take refuge, the vast majority of them in Bangladesh, but also in India. India hosts about 40,000 Rohingya refugees. The Indian government has called the Rohingya illegal immigrants and a threat to national security. The Indian Supreme Court in 2021 upheld the deportation of Rohingya refugees. The deportation of Rohingya refugees is to be seen in the context of India's Citizenship Amendment Act, CAA. 
the CAA grant citizenship government has demonstrated an extraordinary tolerance in dealing with the Rohingya crisis. The Indian government's action is a symptom of communal disturbance. I'm sure that India's support for the Myanmar regime hurts Bangladesh and at the same time makes it difficult to organize regional consensus for dignified repatriation of the Rohingyas to Rakhine. It is interesting to note that while the United States labels the military actions against Rohingyas as genocide, India, Washington's strategic partner in South Asia is on the same boat with China. When it defends militaries, Myanmar military's atrocities against the Rohingyas as a war against terrorism. At the regional level, there is another actor, ASEAN. Its response to the crisis has been mostly ineffective. The inaction by ASEAN is explained by the organization's reluctance in dealing with complex human rights issues. Since it follows the principle of non-interference into the domestic affairs of its members, its sympathy with the Rohingya is limited to lofty words. So, the far, far political will is concerned, ASEAN cannot be expected to do anything meaningful. In the near future, unlike the United States, Europe, China, or India, who are players in this crisis, ASEAN is contented to the role of a spectator. At the local state level, it is Myanmar and Bangladesh whose narratives matter. Bangladesh wants a safe repatriation of Rohingyas back to Rakhine. From a moral standpoint, this is justified. <coughs> Bangladesh has provided temporary settlement to the Rohingyas and is strongly raising the Rohingya repatriation issue as the stay of more than a million Rohingyas for long in the camps may turn out to be a serious security concern and a financial burden for the country. In Myanmar, there are three actors. The Myanmar military, the general public, and the elected civilian government. First, it is very unlikely that the military will be relenting for repatriation after committing genocide against the Rohingyas. Second, in the Indian novelist Amitav Ghosh's fine novel, The Glass Palace, where the British cannons were fired in Mandalay, the first population to feel the imminent insecurity in life to life were the Kalas. Kala was a pejorative word in Myanmar for Indians. The, <coughs> this derogative prejudice is used today to describe the Rohingya. So far, the attitude of general public toward Rohingyas is concerned they identify them as Bengalis, meaning that they are trespassers from neighboring Bangladesh, more precisely from Choktogram. The underlying problem for the general public is that Rohingya is not included among the officially recognized 135 ethnic groups of Myanmar. Third, the possibility of independent elected civilian government is for future to tell because in Myanmar, the army is the state. We have seen how the actors at the global, regional and state levels are playing with the Rohingya issue. Every actor is playing in its own national or group interest. So long the military junta is in power, safe repatriation is ambivalent. At the end, it is only Bangladesh who is taking the physical, security and moral share of the suffering of the Rohingyas. Since Bangladesh is committed to peace, it alone cannot resolve the crisis. Had Myanmar been full democracy, where the military operated under civilian control, the situation in which the Rohingyas find themselves would have been different. This is easily said than done. So long the military is in power, it will always find excuse to perpetrate adventurism into domestic politics in the name of state security. This displaced people are the most aggrieved, hence the violent section of society. With most countries denying Rohingyas their legitimate rights, the extremist groups among them will turn to support from radical organizations both at home and abroad. In the rampage of Ramu, in a series of attacks on Buddhist monasteries, shrines and houses in 2008, in response to the desecration of a Quran, though a distant past was instigated by the psychopathic inertia of replacement or annihilation of the other religious community embedded in the zero-sum mentality of hatred. The same zero-sum mentality led to the assassination of prominent Rohingya leader Muhibullah last September by allegedly Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army, ARSA, in Kotupalong, suggesting that the armed group is active inside Bangladesh to threaten local security. ARSA is accused of running narcotics, murdering political opponents, and instilling a climate of fear in the camps. Rohingya's involvement in trafficking, 
smuggling, gun running, prostitution and other illegal activities have increased fear and anger among the locals and themselves. Human security aspects in the scarcity of food, sanitation, medicine, education or entertainment materials directly affect the social balance of human existence in the refugee camps and also in the local areas. What is even worse is the environmental insecurity rendered by the deforestation of land in setting up camps in a land deficit country like Bangladesh. Rohingya crisis also poses a security concern in Bangladesh's foreign relations with China and India when the domestic politics are factored into the larger canvas of regional imperatives. The tragic part of the crisis is that global politics has also prevented the plight of Rohingyas from being securitized. The post-Cold War era, grand politics has eventually turned China, Russia and India playing their cards in numerous UN resolutions that has not helped ensuring safe return of the Rohingyas. On 6 October 2018 and February 2019, twice Myanmar updated its map showing St. Martin as a part of their sovereign territory in global websites. On both occasions, the government of Bangladesh handed over a strongly worded protest to Myanmar ambassador in Dhaka. The ambassador said that it was a mistake, but there could be another plausible explanation to such place in the act. Traditionally, Bangladesh-Myanmar relations have been lukewarm. Myanmar might be harboring a psychological feeling that both India and China need Myanmar for future supply of energy and natural resources. Such feeling breeds self-satisfaction, emanating from the fact that both China and India played an ambivalent role to the advantage of Myanmar when it pushed vast number of Rohingyas into Bangladesh in 2017. Challenges to security implications to Rohingyas spill into political, socio-cultural, environmental, economic and foreign relations affairs, both domestically, regionally, internationally. In conclusion, I would like to predict that the outcome of the following questions will determine the future of Myanmar in reframing the Rohingya question. First, how the United States fits Myanmar into its Indo-Pacific strategic plan? Second, how persuasive China is in pressurizing Myanmar to implement the three-stage repatriation plan. Third, how strong is the international pressure on Myanmar to restore full democracy in its domestic politics. Fourth, how persistent and forceful the logic is in convincing South Asia that Rohingya crisis has the potential to turn into a serious regional communal security challenge. In all of the other questions, Bangladesh will have to play, Bangladesh will have to play first and most important role. In that role, its policy must be guided by the principles of realism and the need for peace. We want peace, but as Robert Gilpin says, I quote and unquote, if peace were the ultimate aim of statecraft, then the solution to the problem of peaceful change would be easy. Peace may always be had by surrender to the aggressor state. The real task for the peaceful state is to seek a peace that protects and guarantees its vital national interest and its concepts of international morality. In the meanwhile, the protection of the Rohingyas must be complemented with providing education, medical services and income generating activities to protect them from becoming physical moral and ethical threats for Bangladesh. Unless we do so, the effectiveness of local settlement, as it is called now in the language of international law, will further generate into serious national security threats, both internal and external. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, very important points. I'm also reminded of the panel discussion that we both had together at the NDC last month when many of these issues uh, had come up. I uh, particularly appreciate that you brought out the security dimension of the issue, which I think is very important for us to understand, and some of the longer term questions you have posed of the wider geopolitical si question regarding the Rohingya crisis, how our regional relations would be affected, and how we actually need to revisit Bangladesh's foreign and security policy in terms of the Rohingya crisis, the lessons that have been brought forward as part of the crisis. I think one of the issues that I would like to just quickly elaborate on before we go to the uh, audience or esteemed audience for their comments is that 
Uh, how we deal with Myanmar is a very big question for us right now because Myanmar has uh, gone through some major change in the last year and a half. The, uh, since the military takeover, and you have said that in Myanmar the military is the state, at least at the moment that's the situation, a lot of the track 2 and track 1.5 dialogue processes that Bangladesh had with Myanmar are currently on hold. And that creates a different challenge for us because at least until the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, there were a number of different forums in which Bangladesh and Myanmar were talking to each other. And there was an opportunity to at least clear the air about some of the issues. And some of the progress that we had in terms of repatriation and so on was a result of those processes. But now we don't have those uh, forums anymore. Now there is absolutely no contact between uh, Bangladesh and Myanmar, uh, at, the, at least uh, beyond the official level. So I think that creates a serious problem for us. And uh, how amenable the current uh, government in Myanmar would be to even listen to some of our concerns and grievances is also another major question. And I think this is an, an issue, another issue which you have raised, which I think time and again comes up in various forums, is while we got a lot of support from our friends uh, further afield, particularly in the West, from our regional partners, we hardly had any support beyond uh, some statements of support here and there. But in terms of concrete support, our regional partners were not there for us when we were faced with the crisis. So that's also been very disheartening for us that we did not get the support that we required at least from our uh, neighboring country and other regional partners that we have. So I think those are issues that we really need to contemplate. And also, what does it mean for our defense and security policy? What does it mean for maintaining the minimum credible deterrence that Bangladesh needs to maintain and achieve? So I think those are questions that we really need to ponder on. So with that um, brief summary, I think I would open the floor for a discussion. What I propose, ladies and gentlemen, is that we will take a bunch of questions and come back to our esteemed analysts for their answers. So we will open with a question from Ambassador Shamim Ahmed. Um, thank you, Chair, for giving me the floor. And uh, let me start with uh, expressing my profound thanks to Mr. Asif Munir and uh, Air Vice Marshal Mohammed Hassan for excellent presentations. Uh, while uh, taking the floor on this particular subject that is uh, revisiting Rohingya crisis, what lies ahead, I would dwell upon two uh, aspects as I see, which I see as the two main components of this Rohingya issue. One is uh, maintaining them in Bangladesh, uh, settling them, rehabilitating them whatsoever, and the prospect of the eventual repatriation. And I'll make a few general observations, and then I will have a particular question for Mr. Asif Munir. As regards, uh, I think the whatever is being done for the Rohingyas in Bangladesh, the aim should be their eventual repatriation. Because this number has been increasing. What started as a uh, few lakhs uh, back in 1978 uh, has now swelled to one almost one, uh, one and five million, than it can even be. Increasing is only today we have seen the newspaper that they have been trickling in also from India. So, and as regards their repatriation, I mean, there is no, not to speak of light at the end of the tunnel, I don't even see anybody entering the tunnel which would end with a light at the end and eventual repatriation. I mean, to be optimistic about any possible repatriation, I would have loved to see some process of dialogue put in place. It could be bilateral between the two countries, Dhaka and Yangon, or it could be trilateral, it could be quadrilateral, it could be regional, and it could be multilateral. And there is no single dialogue which has been put in place in a structured way. So that's really dismaying. Uh, obviously, in such matters, we would expect Washington to play a lead role, but Washington's attention currently is somewhere else, we all know. Uh, so unless there is, uh, there is not even structured dialogue between Dhaka and Yangon, uh, I mean, whenever we expect a, um, a serious problem to resort, let, let it be water sharing as we had with India or, 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 or border settlement, whatever, there has to be some structured dialogue and the process must show itself with, with progress. Uh, and my second, uh, my, the, the, 
the, the other thing that I want to say is, is put forward a question to Mr. Asif Munir. Is obviously you're you're involved in in uh, the the settlement of the refugees and all these things in the camps. I mean, I'm sure the expenditure that you need that come from contributions, funds, inflow of funds that come from government from the Bangladesh government, which I don't expect to be very large because Bangladesh government has its own priority. International funds from NGOs and some from really from WFP and all. So how do you see in the context of the present uh, other global situation, particularly UN, uh, Ukraine the war and the influx of huge Ukraine refugees uh, in Europe? I mean, how do you see the, the possibility of this inflow of funds uh, coming uh, at the same pace? And do you fear any sort of drying up of the funds, stymied fund? Thank you. Bye. Right. Uh, we'll go to you, sir. Brigadier General Manzur Kadir. Hmm. Uh, thank you very much for, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll directly go to my question. Before that, I would like to thank uh, Ambassador Shamim, and I fully agree with him that our first focus should be repatriation should take place. So, considering that, I have a specific, uh, you know, queries. Uh, as you know, Bangladesh being a democratic country, uh, Bangladesh is in moral dilemma in supporting military government in Myanmar. In this regard, Bangladesh has adopted a cautious stance, which may be interpreted as siding with military junta of Myanmar. Now, at this stage, should Bangladesh conduct a backdoor diplomacy with national unity government, government in exile, to pursue a new policy for reset resettlement of Rohingyas? OK, so this is. Uh, uh, as it was related to my uh, uh, this repetition, another uh, the you have uh, pointed out, out this uh, regarding youths. The youths are very much concerned, and day by day it is increasing. And uh, you have talked about education also about Rohingya. If if the Rohingyas are very much comfortable with their curriculum for higher education or fair establishment for future, then it's not a problem. But the qu question is whether this curriculum is make their better future or not. If you remember one girl named Khushi, I think two years back, he was declined by Cox's Brother local university not to study there. Now very soon it's very kind of government, government has given a special approval for her to study. So in this regard, I was talking to one of the ambassadors just a couple of weeks back, back because recently I'm frequently visiting Rohingya camps for personal reasons and uh, you know taking some statistics on certain issues. So regarding education, what is happening? Actually, they have no future. So. I think some of the countries has taken initiative to take some Rohingya students to allow them to study in women university, Asian women university, Asian university in, women, women yeah. in Chittagong. Mm. So I was coming back to that point, and it's a very good, uh, you know, venture or opportunity. But when I was asking this some Rohingya girls who were studying, that then they were asking me, but what is their future? They are studying and they are studying in women university of Asian women university, but after the completion of their education, they have to come back to the camps. So they will more suffer from frustration. There is no job opportunity. So it has to find you take initiative, provide them an education, but you have to ensure their future. So that's the point. Another point is this, these youths, as I mentioned, these are very vulnerable youths. Mm -hmm. And you know, the terrorism, so-called terrorism, comes out of, I mean, uh, if uh, a deprivation and frustration. And these youths are suffering from, 
frustration as well as they are under privilege. So they are very soft target and lots of opportunities are there. They will turn into terrorists in our term, but they may turn into their freedom fighters. I mean, just, just I, I talk to many, I mean, many people, and, and this is one of the issue, and this will become a grave concern for Bangladesh and Bangladesh security. Okay, okay. Hmm. so these are my three. Thank you, sir. Uh, before we go to the next person, I just want to remind everyone that we are on the record. This is being recorded, and a uh, summary will also be published in the Dhaka Tribune very soon, and both BIPs and Dhaka Tribune will also publish the video in our respective YouTube channels. So we take the last question for this batch from Mr. Abu Rushd, and then we'll come back again after we listen from the speakers. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, here, uh, our honorable ex-chief of staff, General Nuruddin, is here. And General Motin is just sitting beside me, both of them had served as the GUC of 24 Division in Jitagang. That time we were fighting an insurgency and Rohingya issue, I'm just, I referred both of them because when General Nuruddin was the Chief of Staff in 1991, there was a warlike situation. Just we uh, saw eye to eye with the Myanmar army and Sun knows better, better than uh, many of us. And he had to face all this. General Motin, uh, who was the DGDGFI once, he told me personally about a few things, inner, inner things, and I don't want to discuss all those. But again in 2008, we faced the same issue with Myanmar. Bangladesh as a country never, never had any prob uh, uh, created any problem for other countries. We had problem insurgency for long 24 years or so. We solved it through discussion. We fought. Yes, of course we fought and we solved the problem. And what we did that uh, we rehabilitated the uh, tr uh, tribal people, we integrated them with the society, we initiated mass development uh, process there, and that's why that place is so far in, uh, stable, though there are a few problems. Now, that part of the, our country, Chittagang Hill Tracks, now we are now, uh, that these are now infested with more than one million uh, Rohingya refugees. What will uh, be there in future uh, that they have discussed? About security questions, I say, just few days back, I received mail from Russian Rosoborn Export, who is the largest arms exporter in the world from Russia. They wanted to put four pages advertisement in our defense channel. They have been providing me with advertisement for last uh, 10 years or so. So that is the thing that Russia is a big arms supplier to Bangladesh, and China built our armed forces from scratches from 1976. These both countries are involved with Myanmar. That's why I raised this question. And what Shabkat and uh, ABM sir has told, India has also got involved. Our whole Air Force, you see we have Chinese and Russian uh, air aircrafts only few uh, trainer from uh, Western countries. And uh, in Army, our 90% arms and equipments are from China. Same with the Myanmar. Now Russia has been supplying so many equipments to Myanmar, sophisticated equipment. They supplied more MiG-29 than us to Myanmar, and they are going to supply Su-30. Then Ra China is the, uh, say, the, 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 that country supports Myanmar like hell. And you know by this time that when Bangladesh or the, in the UN bodies, the Rohingya issues were, were raised time and again, by, uh, China, my, uh, Russia, and uh, India, these three countries, they opposed. And surprisingly, Pakistan supported us. And during those two uh, probable wars with Myanmar, we found that, yes, logistically, Pakistan provided us with some uh, help, other than no countries, uh, so far I can say. Uh, uh, apart from this, now you just say, you just understand that if there is something, this is not only humanitarian issue, this is not only the, say, societal issue, uh, Shabkat raises as security, from security perspective, 
there is a, the Myanmar, uh, these political parties and others, they recently formed national unity government out in, uh, in uh, America or somewhere, I, so I, I just forgot. And they asked for military help. And uh, last month I was uh, watching a documentary aired by BBC. There, there was a big, I have seen that lot of insurgent groups, they are uh, getting prepared to fight the Myanmar army because this Myanmar army, they are so brutal, you just imagine. They raped, looted, and burned the houses, and they sent a group of people to our country. Uh, just think about it. In front of me, the Honorable uh, Ambassador of Phil uh, Palestine is sitting here. They are also persecuted. But at least the Palestinians, they get the education. They can go outside. They have the passport. They can go for uh, health care and other things. But what about the Rohingyas? Think about them. So there, will be, there is a probability that there might be some security uh, concerns in future. There might be some warlike situation or some other things. The West will come here. How far our DGFI, NSI, SB, Army, Navy, Air Force, how much they can uh, just uh, uh, put their efforts, how much uh, capabilities they have, how much money we can, we can spend. So we have to think, and I should uh, ask, um, I should request, uh, and I will ask uh, Air Vice Marshal uh, Mahmoud, sir, that uh, shouldn't we discuss with China and Russia and India, though you have mentioned it, because they are also our military partner. They are also our defense partner. They are also our good friends. Right. Hmm. So this, this is the crux of the problem. They should come forward. As the West is coming forward, they are giving money. They are supporting us in the UN and everywhere. But now it is the time for China, Russia, and India. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll go back to our speakers. Uh, to uh, Mr. Asif Muni, I just want to add one question to which what has already come. Uh, we're also at a time of economic crunch internationally. And uh, so far, we've managed very well. But we also have our own uh, pressures as well. So at a time of economic crunch globally, this humanitarian support that we have been getting from the international community could that potentially be jeopardized? And if so, how would we plan for it? So we'll first go to you and then come back to, yeah, Ambassador, please. Yeah, sure, sure, absolutely, uh, please. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm sorry I was late for two minutes, I apologize. Uh, as my friend here just mentioned, we have something in common with the Rohingya. We were also forced to be displaced from our home 74 years ago. Actually, one week ago, we completed 74 years. And our worries is that, and we said that before, that the Rohingya will follow us. The same thing, it will happen. If we keep thinking the same way, we have to change our thinking, change the way of our thinking. There's nothing in this world called free lunch. Nobody is going to accommodate you. Nobody is going to feel sorry for you or pity for you because you're the one who's bleeding, not them. They can satisfy you with a few words, nice and kind, with little bit rice and sugar and so on. But they're not going to solve your problem. Why they're not going? Because their interest is not with your interest. The interest of those countries you have just mentioned, China and India and the United States, the main players, they go according to their interest, not according to the Rohingya's interest or Bangladesh interest. Okay? So what you as a Bangladeshi who are paying the price, what can you offer? Because you need to tell those players that if they are not going to take a real steps, a concrete steps to solve this problem, what will you do? If you don't have you will only listen to nice words from them and nothing else. We have been listening for 74 years and we might be wait another 74 years. And we have 80% of the world are supporting Palestine and sometimes more. But what did we get from that support? I was born a refugee I lived as a refugee and I might die as a refugee. 15 million Palestinians, 8 million are a refugee. We were 1 million when we left Palestine. We were forced to leave. And we are 15 million today. 
So expect the same thing from Rohingya. If you made the, if you make the same mistake as we did, we depended on the others. We depended on the Arab world, then we depended on the Muslim world, then we depended on the international community, and then we discover that only weak hide behind international community. Powerful does not hide behind anyone. Powerful face realities. And that's what we need to do. Now I have a small suggestion related to the Rohingya issue, not a permanent one. Why not the United Nations will step in and form some kind of an organization like UNORWA, like they form for us, where they can provide schools, hospitals, uh, universities, and so on for those Rohingya people. So th they can be educated, they grow up, they can go abroad, they can um, study abroad, they can work, and they, they, I mean, you cannot just ignore them and keep them in Cox Bazar or in, 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 in Pashanchar. I mean, there will be a time they will become a gangs, a gangster, because they need to make money. They'll be smuggling weapons, smuggling drugs, they can do everything. So I am just, I wanted to speak more, but unfortunately I have to go to the airport. I have a delegation. It was nice being with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Excellency. Very eloquently expressed, yes. and I think uh, you. you have highlighted uh, the situation very well. We have taken note of your suggestion. Thank you for being with us. So we go to Mr. Asif Munir first, and then we'll come to Vice Marshal Mahmoud. Thank you for the questions. Uh, first, on the uh, from Ambassador Shamim about the issue of funding, and also Shafkat Munir, what you were also talking about. See, and the. Uh, current uh, joint response plan, the requirement is 881 million uh, US dollars. Uh, 881 million US dollars. So I'm just talk speaking from the uh, official JRP uh, summary sheet. Uh, annual requirement, 881 million. But I was looking at the areas. Uh, specific service areas. Within that, food security is 209.5 million. That's the highest. Then health, 110 million. Uh, shelter and NFI, uh, that's 93 million. So that's the kind, and then it uh, trickles down. So what I was talking about in terms of humanitarian plus plus development, one way forward, and I acknowledge what you're saying, that you know, with the global uh, changes, whether it's the cha political changes in Afghanistan or Ukraine and other parts of the world, uh, there might be, uh, and what you mentioned about economic crunch, uh, there might be a slowing down of the funding. But what we've seen also is that every year in the last few years, there have been a shortfall of the, uh, the annual budget for the joint response plan. But somehow this has been managed, but this might be accumulating. Now, I remember possibly in 2020, uh, the pledging conference actually brought in about uh, having a three-year plan. And that was rejected, uh, highly criticized by the Bangladesh government with the notion that we keep on planning for short term that this is being resolved uh, you know, in a shorter term. And that's why when I started off, I just mentioned about the 10-year figure, just to provoke. Uh, because we do have to plan slightly ahead and uh, even for this funding issue, of course there are internal planning. So what I was talking about is that if there is a uh, humanitarian and development nexus, we have seen that in more, uh, say in the last couple of years, very recently uh, ILO has come in uh, on board on a lot of the work in and around uh, Cox's Bazar, but UNDP has been involved quite early on and uh, a lot of the other more traditional uh, development, UN agencies, as well as international NGOs. So some of the areas could be uh, supplemented by uh, the traditional development partners who provide support, say, on food security, uh, health. Maybe not so shelter. Shelter is something of completely different nature in Cox Bazar. But for instance, uh, a lot of the UN agencies have been trying to ensure that government health uh, services are available, whether at the community level through the community clinics, 
to the Brazil Health Centers, to the Cox's Bazaar um, uh, Health Facility at the government level, but also there is a lot of the other international community. So these agencies do have their uh, funding uh, bridges and uh, projects uh, uh, for several years. So that could be a way forward to minimizing completely depending on a, a narrow focus on the humanitarian support from the traditional humanitarian assistance. But of course there needs to be um, you know, a, a campaign and again the, what uh, the ambassador was talking about just now that the Bangladesh has to uh, make the case all the time. Uh, Bangladesh does have its own funding to put in as well in terms of uh, human resources, facilities, as well as emergency funding uh, from its own sources as well, con contributing into this uh, funding. So uh, it's very much, and, and since the population is here, so Bangladesh has to create a case all the time um, and maybe project for several years for their own uh, uh, good, for, for Bangladesh's sake that yes we need to project and you know we when we do national planning we, whether it's the eighth five year plan or the perspective plan we don't plan for a year or so so perhaps for this issue we also need to look at slightly broader scale and not be naive about it um, that's one aspect uh, what my response to that and then uh, what Brigadier General Manzur Kadhi you were talking about access to education and the future especially if uh, there's access to higher education and what happens uh, again we may need to think pragmatic and organizations are working on it, but as you were speaking, I was thinking that perhaps some of the um, organizations who work in and around the camps, they do require uh, people with certain educational qualifications as well. They can come through a competitive process and actually be uh, employed, even uh, for a shorter term. Uh, has to be negotiated with the government, of course, but they can really remain within or around the camps and provide services that a professional can. So that could be one way forward. The other aspect when we talked about, you know, the third country resettlement, uh, some of the uh, people who get access to education, if they're fortunate, or uh, higher education, uh, they may actually want to uh, have access or, you know, take refuge in another country. Uh, so whether the government will be open to that and whether other countries will be open to that. So that could be one. And then again, we're not talking about, talking about large numbers and that has to be a government policy then. At the moment, the government policy does not allow, uh, you know, even moving out of the camps to go access any kind of service, whether it's education, anything else. Um, and uh, then the issue that was also mentioned about uh, you know freedom uh, you mentioned about uh, activists and freedom movement and the issue of insurgency uh, there can be that possibility of course and when these armed groups started to be active especially last year there was that uh, sort of speculation and you mentioned about the uh, intelligence agencies about the different intelligence agencies and we've seen that on the ground there's a heavy presence of all the intelligence agencies dgfi nsi sb and we encounter them always on the field um, uh, and they do have access to information and they have their own informers within the uh, rohingyas as well but that's as a civilian I don't come from a background, army background, but as a civilian, I actually wonder that even with such heavy presence, and then the APBN as well, uh, how come the, uh, the armed groups are being able to operate at the local level? Uh, but as we spoke to APBN, they talked about that even in the last few months, they have um, uh, sort of intercepted or uh, brought into custody and sometimes caught in the crossfire uh, a lot of the activists, armed activists or leaders. But uh, other leaders have cropped up. We know that um, uh, one of the uh, brothers of the RC leader was uh, intercepted actually outside of um, the Coxal Bazaar, I think possibly in Senate, uh, and brought into custody. Uh, so uh, there has been measures, but you take down one leader and there can be other leaders, but so far they've been more involved into criminal activities. But uh, you know, question whether where are these arms coming from? Are they coming from Myanmar? Are they coming from you know countries who you, may, you mentioned who are selling arms? Uh, that the government needs to be aware of, and we are also aware of the uh, geo uh, the geographical uh, location of these camps. Uh, you know, hilly areas, 
forest areas and some of these groups actually sometimes hide uh, in these uh, forest areas you know which is our uh, reserve forest in and around Coxal Bazaar um, so uh, in terms of actually monitoring their activities and that's again part of the government policy possibly I mean many of you may talk about the defense policy that uh, if they're not involved in criminal activities would there be a latent uh, acceptance by the government for the armed groups to prepare for armed resistance whether Bangladesh would uh, look the other way or officially would they really very much closely collaborate with Myanmar whether it's the army government or not uh, that whenever they find any kind of insurgent activities the intelligence agencies on this side will inform the ins intelligence agencies on the other side but we have heard that uh, intelligence uh, personnel from Myanmar do come in and out of uh, Cox's Bazaar uh, so you know they do have presence so how does uh, this work? Uh, you know, the defense analysts will talk about, but I just wonder that how these groups are still can work. And maybe on the last point about, uh, you know, um, yeah, the, I think that's an excellent suggestion. Whether there's a UN uh, agency no, form, no, like, no, like uh, yeah, no, like, but um, the UN seriously, that's a government policy. I, I know uh, the Honourable Prime Minister, and possibly in 2017, in the uh, UN General Assembly, talked about a UN uh, security zone. Yes. But since then, there hasn't been much follow-up at the UN level on that uh, suggestion. Right. Uh, with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think excellent points once again. We'll now go to our Vice Marshal Mahmood and then take another batch of questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Ambassador Shami Mahmood, Brigadier General Mazur Kader, Colonel, and then uh, we had the high, uh, Ambassador from Lebanon, Lebanon, in uh, fact, Palestine. Palestine, and all of them, what they said, they did not raise questions. They only gave their opinions and observations. As I said, that it is very difficult for us to decide what is going to happen in future. But we have to see what is our intent. Our intent is a safe repatriation of the Rangers back home. Or we will to accept them as refugees in our society. Now on the basis of these two we have to strategize. The first point when we think of getting them back home, then we need the international support. And once we need the international support, that must be in the form of hard power. And who can deliver that hard power, we all know. Only the great powers. Like say, for example, without the involvement of the United States in this situation, whether the United States would be interested in involving itself or not, that is a different question. But we cannot simply get them back home. I can give you guarantee any military state which is run by the military authoritarian regime is not am amenable to any kind of soft words. History has proved so. And we cannot expect Myanmar to do the same thing because Myanmar has been running on military junta by the military junta of the military junta since 1962. Have they been leaning any time? They have not been leaning any time. They are leaning only when you speak in their language and that language is martial language, the language of the military. That's why did we fail? We failed because we could not put up enough military deterrence. The question is very simple. Now we want these Rangers to get back safely to Myanmar which is simply not possible without showing them the thread of carrot and stick. That is how the international regime and international politics runs on the basis of the power of the power politics. So the United States of America is the most powerful unless we get United States of America and convince them this is the situation. Unless you do so, your strategic, in fact, salience in the Indo-Pacific Ocean might be at question after, say, 15 or 20 years, when China becomes the, one of the leading states in the Indian Ocean. So that is why we have to make the United States understand that their involvement is most important. Why I'm telling this? Because when I was a military observer in former Republic of Yugoslavia, I found that how much Europe was dealing with this situation, unless and until it was the direct involvement of the United States under the leadership of Bill Clinton, that the pro uh, Kosovo, and Bosnia and Kosovo. Only it was there it was possible. That is how the world politics work. Now, we have seen that in times of our crisis, 
and in Russia, China and India. All of them are basically have not been able to help us because of their own interest. Everybody works on the basis of its own interest. Now in the world, if you look, we have global leaders, strategic leaders, we have regional leaders, and then we have local leaders. The strategic leader will always act on strategic interests. Its interest is global. China's interest until now is regional. And a local leader, India is still a local leader. In fact, it has not, I can't say that India is a regional leader in the sense that India can act as a benign, benign regional, getting the allies of it to support its cause. This is, this is the nature of the strategy in which the world operates. It has been operating since long, since the time of Alexander the Great or since the time of, say, Peloponnesian War. Very simple. Now, if you want that, then I have said that we have to get right states on board and we have to also persuade through the international agencies like the United Nations to accept China of its rule for the completion of the three states repatriation plan. Whether China will do it or not, this is questionable. Third one is that we have to tell India that if you do not resolve this problem with us, and if you treat Rohingyas as illegal immigrants, that might have a conflagration within Bangladesh itself, and the entire South Asia will be then on the tips of communal disharmony. If this is the case, then we have to go on a hard line. And for getting into a hard line, it is the responsibility of the Foreign Ministry to get the Ministry of Defense on board. Because then we will get the strategic plan also accordingly as it is needed, as we have done in case of Chiragong Hill Tracks. Like containing in it, in service and not merely through the soft power. We also applied hard power when it was necessary. Service here, service here. And I used to fly in those days as a pilot. And finally, if you want that, now, this is not possible because we have already passed through four or five years and it is very difficult to get the great powers involved in our cause, then we have to think in a different line. Probably in that case, we have to integrate the Rohingyas into, into our life. Otherwise, the Rohingyas might become, in due course of time, a greater threat and security challenge, not merely in terms of financing, that is the least, in terms of communal disharmony. Thank you very much. Uh, so we'll take another batch of questions, and if we have time, we'll take another three. So I already have three show of hands. We'll start with General Zahir, go to Mr. Humayun Kubir Bhuya after that, and Ms. Aisha Kubir from Putamalo. So let's, we'll start with uh, Lieutenant General Zahir. Sorry. Sir, please. I should stand up. Sorry being very late, uh, I didn't listen to the two speakers, but then uh, I'm involved a little bit uh, in this uh, process of dialogue and uh, issue of repatriation. Uh, I want to give you examples to sensitize the matter. And since this is on the recorded, uh, I can't really speak from my heart. And, and I, I, I'm from National Defense College. We have Chatham House rule, and I think such issues have to be discussed under Chatham House rules. Yeah. Uh, if, it, if you don't discuss it under Chatham House rules, we will come to nothing, as a matter of fact. And because here we'll be discussing diplomatically, uh, and, and we are going to actually bypass what is, what is the real way forward, really, for this to resolution of this problem. I'll give you one example. Bangladesh has been negotiating for all these times. But, the, the, but we have not set the rules of the game. For example, we wanted that, okay, there's a problem with uh, citizenship, but at least acknowledge that you are going to give residentship to them. Mm. And I said that somebody from the Myanmar government has to speak that, yes, this is, a, this is and they have to really publicize this. It has not been done. It has not been done. So, so, they, so you see, our position, we, we are so weakly dealing with the matter. Next thing is the number game. We, till today, we cannot get the number. And you know that already 40,000 babies have been born by this time. And what is the future of these babies? How will they take them back? So these things have not been... 
Then another example recently, very recently. So previously also, government of Bangladesh sent 10,000 names for verification. Only 150 was cleared. In one of the so-called track three dialogue where I was present, I said, on what basis did you do it? Do you have a national database? Because we don't have a national database. So how come you have, out of 10,000 names, how come you only cleared 150? And, and, and we are sitting with that, we are, and we are not doing anything about it. Very recently, very recently, it is an offer from Myanmar. So they wanted to rehabilitate, take repatriate some in Mongdu area. Mm. And, and you know, and Bangladesh sent a list. Again, they say 300 only. So if this is the case, how many, many years will this take to take back this? Now, 11 lakhs, and it will increase if the wage is increasing to 20 and 30, as, as the Belstein ambassador said here. So where for, before us now, Bangladesh, is uh, we, sh we should we negotiate softly or we should negotiate softly along with also power behind. So we have two now fate accomplished for us. One is accept them as Bangladesh citizen yeah, in due course whether you call them uh, whatever name, but uh, they will live here. And some of them will have go and have a th third country repatriation, uh, very, very small numbers. Other, other option is that Dr. Zafrullah say, fight it out. Allow them to fight it out. But till now, uh, this plan B or whatever you say, plan C, if nothing has been talked about this. If Myanmar is told that Bangladesh is considering plan B or C, then this military government will take cognizance. <coughs> Otherwise, they will not. We have to say that this is our plan A. We want to be nice. We have, I have told in one of the seminars that we have never, ever did anything against you. What, what did we do as Bangladeshi that you have wasted indirect war on Bangladesh by sending refuse it three times, not once, twice, this is the third time. And, and now I found that they are a little soft in the table, but then when they go back, nothing happens. So uh, I believe that we are talking about their education, and this is Bangladesh has its own problem. We are not Western Europe, that um, they have, when they admit some people in their country, they also give certain rights right to work, right to education, and all these things. And, uh, and this cost. And do we have that money? So we have to consider. So giving only right to education to only 0.001%, what difference does it make, really? So I think uh, the, we have to, the, in negotiating, there is a dilemma for Bangladesh now that is a military government and if the political government comes, if we cooperate with the military government, what will happen then? But the reality is, as your Vice Marshal has already said, that the military in Myanmar is there to stay, and here to stay, there to, they will stay. And so uh, we have to negotiate with the military. And now how we will negotiate? It, negotiate that's the very, very, what I'll say. Will it be covert or overt? That is the only thing we have to decide. And my suggestion currently is to do a covert negotiation, which is again, I can't tell here because this is Chatham House rule that I could have said further. But, if, but ultimately it will be overt. People will know that you are negotiating with them. And, and we have to weigh it up. I believe that negotiating with the military, weight, with plan A along with plan B is the only way forward. Okay. Your comments, please. Thank you. Uh, we are running short of time, so I'll go to the next two questioners, but please keep your questions brief. Uh, Mr. Human Kubir Bhuya from Dhaka Tribune. Uh, <coughs> good afternoon to everybody. Uh, actually, uh, in my 30 years uh, career as a journalist, I think I have written maximum number of stories. 
with regard to Rohingya. So, I mean, this is an issue that I have been working on since 2005. Uh, and uh, uh, I just want to make some uh, brisk observation regarding some words that I heard. Number one, the human rights Marshal has said that international morality, with all due respect, it doesn't exist. Believe me, it does not exist. It only exists in dictionary and, uh, I mean, in this type of discussions. In reality, it doesn't exist at all. And as the Palestinian ambassador said, he actually, I think, he actually summed up the discussions. He actually summed up the discussion and he left. He's a clever man. Uh, 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 because, you see, and what Lieutenant General Zahir has just said, he couldn't say something, but I can say, uh, I, as I'm not a military man, uh, I am only accountable to my wife, so I can say, uh, <laughs> is that, is that I, put, I put this matter to the top foreign ministry official. I said to him, we have three choices. Is that one, arm them, let them fight their own fight, Second, invade Rakhine and push them back or declare a war with Myanmar. Without one of these options, there is no solution to this problem. Not my words. There is no solution. There was a time, as uh, Rush Bhai was saying, there was a time, perhaps we were militarily superior uh, to Myanmar. But now we uh, lost that edge. I think today, if we want to, we cannot win a war against Myanmar because our people are concerned about the military spending. Our government, although not totally democratic, but it has some sort of accountability towards its people due to Facebook and other social platforms, but Myanmar doesn't have that uh, problem. They can purchase arms at their will, they don't have to think about the money because they don't care whether people are dying or not. So we have this uh, limitation, so we cannot be literally superior uh, uh, to Myanmar, at least in near future. I don't know what will happen after 10, 15 years. I'm talking about near future. And regarding Asif uh, uh, uh about the long-term plan, I mean, you have to understand the government's stance of view because, you see, government doesn't want to give the impression to the outer world that we are uh, uh, dealing this crisis uh, in a long, uh, as a long-term issue because it will, uh, it will, what should I say, it will enthuse the Myanmar military to push more vendors uh, to the country. So, I mean, uh, in a nutshell, actually, this is such a problem, you know, nowadays I don't write about the issue uh, because I don't have any issues left and I cannot write enough. Uh, I mean, uh, and uh, I will end with the, one of the remarks that the veteran airman has made, uh, that you have to uh, speak in the language of military. Uh, well, fine. If you can, uh, well, as a citizen, I will welcome it because I have seen how this crisis is engulfing the prime land of our country. The, I mean, we only have Cox's Bazaar, actually, if we look at tourist extra attraction or whatever. And there are some other uh, KPI as well in the Cox's Bazaar area. So we need to get rid of them. But I don't think we can. Last. I asked Boris Johnson when he was the foreign minister that will you go for a Kosovo and Bosnia-like solution? He outright denied. And I asked Deputy Secretary of State. She also was not interested at all. So without them, unless you can create a situation like no-fly zone in Rakhine, you cannot get this problem solved at least in the near future. Thank you. Uh, we'll take a question from Ms. Asha Kabir, and we are quite short of time, but we'll see if we can take more questions later. Mine is not exactly a question, just a very short comment, a bit more benign. <laughs> it's, um, I have to thank uh, Ambassador Shamim for a word he used 
about uh, in one of the newspapers today they re uh, report there was a report and he was mentioning it that the, about the Rohingyas trickling in from India unfortunately the newspaper didn't use the word trickling who I, I appreciated you using the word trickling they used the word sneaking, sneaking yeah. you wrote that um, Rohingya refugees or Rohingyas are sneaking in from India into Bangladesh and that is such an objectionable word as a media person I felt extremely embarrassed and ashamed that we are saying that they were sneaking in because sneaking would imply like they were criminals or something it's doing and out of the word illegal, illegal and sneaking. These are the two words they use prominently in the headlines. So just as a media person, and I'm sure uh, Humayun Bhai will agree too, that as a media person, when we deal with such sensitive issues, we should be very sensitive about the words we use too. That's just the comment I wanted to make. Thank you. You, sir. Please. is the rise of Arakan army there. They effectively control 70% of the land in Rakhine. Could you kindly introduce yourself? Uh, Not everyone I'm knows a, you over here. I'm uh, a bureau chief of AAP in Dhaka. So what our, we have uh, like a bureau office in Myanmar. So what we heard or what we follow, when we follow, we see that since 2016, since they're like a rise, they now effectively control the entire land where Ro Rohingya have been evicted from. So how do you like solve the situation? Arakan Army. Yes, Arakan Army. Mm -hmm. When you know that another rebel group has like uh, gained strength and they can uh, like uh, jeopardize any of your move to repatriate the refugees. Right. Okay. Thank you. So a brief intervention from Ambassador Shahid and then you sir and then we will end the uh, point. Yeah. Yes. Sir. <laughs> thank you. No, no, thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Zairwai, uh, thank you. Uh, well, uh, you have been very smartly covered yourself by saying that uh, it is not Chatamar's rule, so I'll restrain, restrain myself. But in view of the time constraint, I'll be very brief. I just want to mention, did Bangladesh went wrong somewhere? Because when we were uh, fixing up the names uh, who will be repatriated, we sh I think the government could have involved the third party also. Uh, that would have ensured uh, that third party is monitoring. Uh, I suppose maybe the, the bilateral uh, uh, negotiation could have, uh, did not, uh, you know, agree to it. But uh, nevertheless, I think the world was watching. So why, why not uh, for formally, because, you know, there had been involvement. So that is, I think, we missed one small boat. And uh, having said that, I would also say over here that uh, a hard line is... Uh, difficult and the most uh, uh, easy way to solve any problem. But I think before going into the hard line uh, problem, uh, which uh, I think uh, our speakers and many others may made it a point, uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, I look at it that it is basically an ASEAN issue. And we tried to involve the ASEAN. And some countries did get involved, whether it's Indonesia to some extent, Malaysia. But they all said, uh, in ASEAN, we can't raise this issue. But, you know, uh, Myanmar being an ASEAN country, they could have immediately, this is a big forum, many countries are there, they could have worked on it and there, there should be constant pressure on Myanmar because they are, they, they, they are quite an active member of the, the ASEAN group. Uh, that would have helped. I think we, we, we didn't work on that. Uh, obviously, China is a very important player. India is an important player. You know, the hard powers are there. And Bangladesh is quite, uh, you know, strong in raising the issues but it is not making much dent. And I think uh, uh, it's not going to happen. This is a very serious problem. I think we talked about it that it started from uh, before our independence. And uh, General uh, Nuruddin, being the army chief, uh, did solve to some extent, to some extent. But uh, I think they did work on it on a permanent basis. Things were easier in those days. So we, again, we said that we missed another vote over there. So now it's, it's a quite, a, quite a dilemma. I think every, uh, every problem has a solution. And I'm sure General Nuruddin will be able to answer this question. Thank you, sir. We'll uh, hear from General Nuruddin first and then uh, come to you. And uh, for uh, those of you who are not aware, General Nuruddin Khan is a former minister and former chief of army staff. He commanded the army from 1990 to 94. Thank you, Mr. Uh, 
I will take long because I already have taken too much of time. So I had you forced me to <laughs> take the mic. And uh, uh, what's your name? Rush. 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 Why have you been during those just 1991? Who was that? He was the president of my tenure in 1991, 1994. Uh, I wrote a book about uh, Hindu Jackson in 1997. Can you get a copy of that? Sure, thank you. I was the first half of 1992, 1994, a very critical period for all of this. And uh, in 1991, the Rohingya issue came. And, uh, Ambassador Shahid has very rightly said, it was that an easier issue for us. Nothing will bear you out. And uh, we are militarily stronger than the Burmese army. And in those days, the China did not commit so much to the Burmese cause than they have done it now. So we are in a better position, strategically we are in a better position. And if you could take the risk, what uh, the last journal speaker Mayotte has said, should have been the answer at that time. Miss the boat. Yes, you did not want to speak from the heart, but you did say that. I told you. Spoke 90 percent. <laughs> so what I found when he just said that. Initially, the discussion was very mild, polite, gentlemanly and all. But last leg, uh, the speaker spoke out very boldly and rightly and correctly. And that is probably going to be the only solution. Rigas have to fight it out. How, when, how, whether or not we don't know. My Asim Bodhi and the uh, average person, Mahmoud Uri, will tell us. The high time that we have got to think of that line seriously. And being a democratic country, we have the problem of the national government to cause. If we could work on that psychology, then there is only way to solve the issue. As I had the very right to say, that to we could have been, uh, we could very much in a position to win the war with the Obama. I mean, the you stop that time, did bring it to the notice of the government. And government's attitude was very new crop. I wish they could be stronger, bolder, and supporting. We were so the issue that time in 91. You must have the Arakan issue. Arakan army. Arakan is a total issue plus the army. That is one of the ways we have to look forward to solve the problem of Rigas. Because we have no land. Our land is limited. Ultimately, we have to settle the Rigas in the Arakan land. That has been the dear solution. Now we aim at that. Rigas have to do it themselves. There is many assemblies that they left now. Then ultimately started doing it. A time will come when Rigas will feel very strongly that it is our issue and we have got solved it. We have got to fight it out. There is no other way. And diplomatically, being a friendly with China, we have got to work with them so that they don't go all out to support the Babi's Janta. So, Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. The dear solution was given by an American uh, congressman who said that the North the West Arakan should be annexed to Bangladesh and the Rohingya should be settled there. Exactly. And, uh, and, and, and now I have broken uh, everything of Tender Hall's rule and I'm telling you <laughs> that is the only dear solution we and, and And how that will be done, uh, and, and, and how that can be achieved, whether can, that can be achieved. Only country that can engage it through is, as said by the Iraq Marshal, is the United States of America. Right. And, so and taking China on board also diplomatically. Right. Yeah, we're running really out of time, so I'll just uh, you'll have the final qu uh, point, and then we will break for uh, uh, tea. But could you kindly introduce yourself, please? Yeah. 
Thank you, Shavkat. Uh, Dr. Mahavir Rahman, I teach political science at North South University. Uh, we have not given Rohingya refugee the, the refugee status. We call them uh, forcibly displaced Myanmar national. I was wondering, is it helping our cause? Is it helping the Rohingyas? Or is it even helping Bangladesh? Because without refugee status, actually, uh, we are not even thinking, considering for third country settlement. Even if we send them, want to send them, the refugee status is a must. And we have been able to, to, to uh, refuse it, that okay, uh, we have not been signatory uh, for the uh, Geneva, uh, for the uh, refugee convention that they will be refugees. But at the end, we have to deal with them as refugees. My question is, how long we can sustain by saying that they are just uh, forcibly displaced Myanmar national? They are not refugees. Number two, are we consistent in our policy with regards to Rohingyas? Because in 2017, Bangladesh proposed for a uh, security zone, UN-sponsored security zone. And after that, we have not been following consistently. We are not crying for that. We are not walking into that direction. Have we left that? If so, for what reason? Thank you very much. Right. Uh, we've had a very splendid set of questions and comments, but all good things must come to an end. So we'll now go back to our two speakers. We'll do it in reverse order, first with their Vice Marshal Mahmood and then to Mr. Munir. And then we will uh, end today's discussion and break for tea. Thank you. <laughs> oh, we'll, we'll review that. Don't worry. <laughs> Sir, so mostly your interventions have been very enlightening, enlightening for all of us. I'll not elaborate much because most has been covered. But there are two points only I'll talk about. One is ASEAN. Uh, ASEAN will not be very much proactive. This is my personal feeling because I was the High Commissioner in Brunei. And any time I raised the issue of Rohingya, Brunei is a Muslim country, and then there was Indonesia also, Malaysia also, they always said that uh, in the ASEAN forum, this question can cannot be raised because whatever, whatever regionally they do, they do it on the basis of consensus. And when it comes to the point of human rights issues, there are so much of contention that it is better that they drop the case rather than discuss about it. This is one point. Uh, and the other point that you have talked about international morality, you are very right. There is no such thing as international morality. But I always feel that international morality has to be also undergirded by the act of realism. Like say, take the case of Woodrow Wilson's 14 point principles, any attack on a single country will constitute an attack by all. Okay, on all. So that means that was a collective security in which you are applying the military power just to defend your international morality. That was the point. But I have enjoyed your comments, interjections very much. I think I have learned much more uh, from your viewpoints on whatever I have delivered in my paper. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll be brief, um, because, and I won't go into the security issues because I'm not eloquent on that, but uh, very briefly on the couple of points. One about the, what you mentioned about the media sensitivity, and quite often I see, especially in the local media, quite insensitive and kind of uh, demonizing uh, Rohingyas. They're all crooks, all criminals, all bad people, and they've just come to suck us. And they're just taking advantage of Bangladesh as if it's just an economic opportunity that they come here for. Uh, a lot of people feel that as well, perhaps, without the knowledge, but media, we would hope that wouldn't have that kind of a role. It's like a media trial that goes on and on and on. It's mostly the local media, both uh, print and electronic, and I can say this on record. The other thing I can mention about is the issue of um, ASEAN. Not necessarily ASEAN as such, but I've seen that, especially last year, and much to the proactiveness of the 
prominent admission representative of Bangladesh, um, Mr. Abab Fatima, which happens to be uh, some of our former bosses boss at IOM, uh, much to her initiative, uh, during the last year, the third committee meeting of the UN, some of the ASEAN member states did acknowledge that there are atrocities going on or had been against the Rohingya community. So not taking the ASEAN path as such, but in terms of ASEAN members. So within not ASEAN, but again, uh, dealing with, I don't remember which countries, perhaps Vietnam and Cambodia, uh, have uh, been siding slightly on the uh, Rohingya issue uh, and against Myanmar. So that can be a diplomatic effort uh, that can be done. And regarding the issue of refugee status, very briefly, I mean, the government does talk about that, yes, without, um, you know, signing up to the Refugee Convention, we do allow certain things within uh, our existing laws, certain access to rights and protection. And as far as I understand, the FDMN was mainly used because of the bilateral uh, discussions, because Myanmar does not accept the term Rohingya. So if we're taking a more hard line, Perhaps at that point, Bangladesh does not need to be concerned about FDMN. As far as I understand, it's more because of diplomatic relations with Myanmar and as part of our foreign policy, friendly to um, you know our, uh, our neighbors. Uh, so that was the reason. Otherwise, uh, there's no reason that to continue with that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, it's been an excellent uh, discussion. <coughs> Excuse me. When we were telling the numbers for this program, I was quite heartened to see that so many people had actually RSVP'd with their confirmation. And it just goes to show with the number of embassies present in the room, in, in the room, universities, international organizations, just goes to show what an important issue this is. And we're very privileged that today we also heard from our former army chief, former minister, his own experience of dealing with the crisis in 91, and so many different perspectives have come together. Uh, it's very difficult to summarize uh, such eloquent uh, interventions, but I will just uh, not attempt at summarizing everything, but I will just say that uh, I'm really glad that we were able to bring forward some of these issues, because the whole purpose of this roundtable, which we organize every month, as you know, with Dhaka Tribune, is to come up with out-of-the-box uh, solutions for various problems and challenges and in international issues that we have in front of us. One of the issues which I have been personally speaking about for quite some time is that the Rohingya crisis should serve as a reminder for us that there are many things that we also need to sort out at our end as well. For instance, greater coordination between our agencies, greater political military coordination between our foreign and defense ministries or the armed forces division, more early warning capability. We are still sometimes at a loss when some of the disasters and issues hit us. But we should have had better early warning capability to predict that this kind of a situation was developing. We also need to develop greater understanding about Myanmar as a country. We need to take stock of how many Myanmar language speakers we have on our uh, various agencies of the government and how we can increase that capacity. We need a big picture analysis on what shape of things will uh, take place in Myanmar in the coming days. We have to use tools like horizon scanning in order to see what the situation in Myanmar will be like, what the regional situation will be like, and how we can cope with that situation. And yes, uh, our diplomacy must at all times be backed up by a minimum or, or backed up by credible deterrence and also by force. Because just mere words are not going to help us in any negotiation. I have been part of our track two initiative with Myanmar like uh, respect to Jenna Zahir here. And we have seen that, uh, because we have every three months, we have actually met the Myanmar side. We have talked to them. So we are quite aware. And again, we can't go into a lot, a lot of the specifics here for time and other reasons. But we are aware about how the Myanmar side thing. I have been to Myanmar as part of a delegation in 2019. Uh, it's a very complex issue. And it is not going to solve itself automatically in a short span of time. but. My point is what we can do from here, now that the COVID pandemic has receded and we can again focus on some of these issues in a big, very big way. Let us all work together with our international friends to see how we can find a solution. Because at the end of the day, the plight of the Rohingya people, the humanitarian catastrophe that is uh, going on, really breaks all of our hearts. And we all want that them to be repatriated back to their homes peacefully, voluntarily. 
and we also want peace and stability to return to that region of Bangladesh. Once again, on behalf of Bangladesh Institute of Peace and Security Studies and the Dhaka Tribune, I thank you all for being with us here today. And please join us uh, for some refreshments outside. Thank you.